Good evening from the Gail Lemeron Auditorium in the Captain Willie Miller Building on the campus of Embry-Riddle. Welcome to the Embry-Riddle Speaker Series. I'm Mark Bernier, the moderator for a very special event tonight. Live from California, we'll talk with the star of this movie, Bob Hoover, the pilot's pilot, and his producer of this film, Kim First. And then, Flying the Feathered Edge will be shown to the audience here in Embry-Riddle, and we'll have our drawing, no purchase necessary, but our drawing for the autographed poster at the conclusion of the program. Kim, Bob Hoover, welcome to back to Embry-Riddle. Mr. Hoover had an opportunity to meet you when you were an honored guest here last year. It's good to see you, and a very early happy birthday to you, sir. Thank you so much. Kim, thank you for making these arrangements so we could do this from Bob's house. The, the audience can see the memorabilia in the background. I'm going to have questions for both of you, and we may incorporate a question or two from the audience before we conclude. I want to begin by asking you, you have spanned, Bob Hoover, the generations from a generation of test pilots, uh, military, to test, to business, to air shows. What do you attribute as the key to your longevity in this industry? I think, first of all, I have to say, having a lot of good luck. <laughs> you, I, I, you, I jokingly say that because I never felt that I was any different than any other pilot that ever learned to fly an airplane. As a matter of fact, I was the most unlikely person to ever become important in aviation. I got airsick on my first flight. And it remained with me for what seemed like an eternity. And uh, I, I, I decided what I really wanted to do more than anything else as a youngster, the dream was shattered. And so I said to myself, are you going to give in? How bad do you really want to learn to fly an airplane? And so I decided to swallow my pride and my air sickness. And I, I got lessons, learned to fly, and uh, the rest is history. But I, I get good assignments in the military, none that I chose, but they exposed me to, uh, I've often joked about disaster more than anything in the world. And having survived all of that, it better prepared me for all the rest of the assignments that I received that I had not intended to ever experience. And uh, collectively, all of the kind of things that I had to do, because I, that's what I was told to do, uh, kept me from doing my real objection, uh, objective, which was to be a fighter pilot and someday maybe shoot down five enemy airplanes and become an ace. Well, I never accomplished that, but I sure had my share of air battles and, and combat, and I'm proud of all of it. I flew with the British uh, for a long while there, uh, in the early part of the war before we got airplanes over there in England, and they got me mixed up, and, or got my group mixed up, and I was the youngest fighter pilot in the, in the group, but with the most experience, and as a sergeant, I was put in charge of both officers and enlisted men, unheard of in the history of the services. But I've got those secret orders in the back of the book that I wrote, Forever Flying. And most people would say, oh, I've been in the service, never had a sergeant in charge of a bunch of officers, and he was the youngest guy in the crowd. Well, it's fact, and those orders are in the back of my book because I wouldn't have believed it either if someone had told me about it. But I've been lucky. Every bit of it has been luck. And I've been the most fortunate person in the world to meet the most wonderful people in the world and, be and become friends with people that were icons in aviation and aerospace. And I got to meet my heroes that I would never have dreamed of being, becoming their friends and spending a the last few years of their lives uh, as, as dear friends and, and seeing one another frequently. And I, 
I just blink them across the, the board for you quickly. Uh, Jimmy Doolittle was number one. Uh, I could go through with all of the aces uh, from World War One. as a matter of fact, all the way on up. I have pictures of my friendship with all of these different people together. And uh, I, I learned a lot from everyone I talked with. And so I don't really know what I could say I've done that's really anything important. I just did the best I could and looked at those people I admired and respected and tried to, to uh, emulate them, if you will. And here I am, and I'm proud to be with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Kim, I want to ask you, Steve Hinton, who's the president of Plains of Fame at the Air Museum, said, this is the best job of storytelling of a legend in our business that I have ever seen. How difficult was it? Because it, it, everyone seemed to run to the camera for the opportunity to talk about Bob Hoover. How long did it take for you to get the collection of this talent, which people are going to see on the movie tonight, to give testimony to Bob's work? That's a great question. Um, you know, Bob's story, the most difficult part about it is it's so big. It's not like here's someone who did you know, five really momentous, important things. And you can kind of really set those like, you know, like the stones in a, you know, in a ring or something. And, oh, here are the five great moments. And we really know that the whole story tracks around that. Um, you really said it well when you said, I mean, he's been fully just like the top of the industry in like, you know, at least three areas um, of, you know, experimental test flying, um, you know, his, his, uh, his history within the Air Force was something that continued to be storied after he left the Air Force. I mean, when we went to the F-86 and the F-100 conventions, these fighter pilots had heard about him when they were coming up. So he was a legend in the Air Force. Um, and then, of course, within business aviation, I mean, he was an executive at North American Aviation. So there's that whole development and the incredible history of, of what he did with that company. And then as an air show pilot where, you know, many, you know, modern people, you know, and, and probably up to, you know, the last, you know, 40 years know his history as, as the top air show pilot in the world. So it's a, it, the hardest part was just, there was just so much to cover. Well, and, and what do you, you know, what do you leave out? And as far as collecting the interviews, just as far as that question that you asked, um, we were very lucky. Uh, one of the, times I filmed him, we did a whole week at Oshkosh, and that's a time when all of his friends, uh, many of them happened to be in one place at the same time. And then we also went to the F-100 and the F-86 conventions, which was again a week, week and a half back to back that had a lot of top generals and people who were friends of his and people who had um, seen him fly and really knew his history. So those were the two main ones. And then we had probably about five or six other interviews around those, but during those weeks, we really interviewed quite a few people. When the people assembled with us have a chance to watch this movie in a moment, they're going to notice that Bob Hoover, for a long time, flew wearing a traditional suit like this. You had footage where we're seeing Bob get in and out of planes. How long in your career, did you fly in a suit before you were finally convinced to fly in a flight suit, Bob? Well, you've asked a very good question. I have been asked that question many times. We wore parachutes and, and all sorts of uh, appropriate flight gear uh, in the military. But when I got out and became a civilian test pilot, I thought, I really want to make flying look enjoyable. I want the young people that see people flying not think you have to be uh, some famous person. You, 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 you could, I, I, I thought I would just wear a business suit. And so I did. And it became a, sort of a thing with me. I still kept the parachute in the, the jet fighters that I was demonstrating and testing, but uh, I was trying to make it, uh, learning to fly is not that 
that uh, difficult. Uh, if I can do it, anybody can. And I wanted to make it look easy and being best, uh, dressed appropriately uh, seemed, to me, seemed to me to be the best way to get that word out to people. It's not that, that difficult. And I, I've got to tell you a funny story. I was at some event and Debbie Reynolds was there and they brought her over and introduced her to me. And this was in her early days as a, as a heyday movie star. And uh, she was visiting with me and she, and she said, I, I can't believe it. you're, you're going to do, do some flying here in a, a business suit like that. And I said, yes, I said, you know, sometimes it gets kind of warm in there. Uh, why don't you hold my coat while I, I'm flying? Well, I, I've had more fun telling this story. When I came back, I couldn't recognize my coat. She had gotten so nervous thinking that I was going to kill myself. <laughs> she would have my coat. I got a picture of her right here in the, in the den uh, holding my coat. But I've had more fun in my life than, than any, any two people or more should have. Thank you. Kim, how much arm twisting went into trying to get Bob to do this film? Was there any arm twisting? Bob is an, he is such a good storyteller and he's a natural performer, actually. He did get a little, like, you know, we spent a whole day with him during the principal interview and, you know, it's, it was a, well, actually, that's a very funny story because I have, you know, I've interviewed quite a few people doing documentary work and I've done a lot of behind the scenes work for the, the studios and doing making ofs. And so, you know, I know you go in into a, a situation with someone like Mr. Hoover and you do your homework. You've, you've, I read his book. I had studied up on, you know, the significant aspects of his career. It was my fifth aviation and aerospace documentary as a film editor. So I, you know, I knew the area a bit, but day one, um, you know, I brought my film crew in and it, it's a bit of an ordeal. I mean, he, you know, he's very, very good and very patient. And fortunately he's done a lot of, you know, um, speaking in front of people and he's, uh, incredible. I mean, you know, you just kind of put the camera on him and he's, you know, and he's great. But, um, day one, you know, I was there, I had my whole list of questions for him. And, you know, by the end of day one of this full day of filming with guys coming in and out of his house and you know we, we completely redid his you know his 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 space here and end of day one we had just gotten through his time in world war ii wow and that was we hadn't touched on any of the rest of his career and and these were not extraneous answers to the questions so set up another shoot day we had a second shoot day and i thought well, we're gonna nail it this time day two we got through his time, I think, in Nor at North American, but we hadn't touched on, you no, know, we had just gotten through Edwards Air Force Base in the 40s, 1945. We hadn't touched on his air show career, North American aviation, none of it. So we had three full days of shooting, and um, by the end of that, we had logged 12 and a half hours of professional stories. Yeah, see, this is what I was afraid of because I know I only have you guys for a short time. I have some uh, history students, junior high school history students in the audience. They want to know, Bob, will you give us a little bit of what it was like to escape from a German prison camp? You were in a Stalag. You tried to escape three times. I believe it's at least three. You were running out of options, and finally, you staged a fight, I understand, among prisoners. You diverted the attention of the prison guards. Hope I have this right. Then you hopped over a barbed wire fence, and you, you were looking for refuge, and you stole an airplane to fly to freedom? Do I have it right? Well, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to tell you, and, and, and all of your audience, that the, the most unwise thing I ever did in my life, and I don't know that this word exists, but I have often said, you are looking at the dumbest pilot that ever flew an airplane. Because 
the war was two weeks from ending. And I'd been in that uh, Stalag Lip one. When I arrived, there were 1,000 men there. And when I left, there were 10,000 men. And no one had successfully escaped. I had made many attempts and I became well known among the prisoners for my attempts at escaping. I spent more time in solitary than most, uh, except for uh, a handful who were there longer than me. And uh, I, there were others that were in solitary, uh, uh, Russ Spicer. And I'd like to mention his name because he was a colonel at the time, the senior colonel in the prison camp. And Russ was a hero of every prisoner in that camp in Stalag Lift One. He stood up one day uh, and we'd have a parade. Uh, all the prisoners would come out of their buildings and would all be standing at attention and they would have their guards go through and count us and they'd go down each line, count the people. And uh, Russ Spicer said, when it was his turn to get the mic from the the German commandant, he said, uh, I want to remind every one of the men in this camp that these are our enemy. I would like you to know exactly what they are doing. We have just had 1,000 prisoners that were shot because Patton had extended himself overextended himself and his supply line with ammunition and support was left behind. And the Germans pulled us a pincer which is encircling his thousand troops that were out ahead of everybody else. And they were running out of ammunition, food supplies and everything else. And they, they shot every one of them, 1,000 of them. But two of the fellows were alive when Patton's forces then did come over and, and recapture their territory. And all the rest were dead. And he, he got word of this through a new prisoner. And he said, let's make it so difficult that they will never forget us as long as they live. And make, make it difficult for them to take care of us and keep us in this prison camp. And he said, uh, that's what I expect of every man here. Well, gee whiz, they just grabbed him just like that and gave him a death penalty. And on a daily basis, Russ Spicer lived for seven months in solitary confinement. And I was frequently doing escape attempts and failing every time, we dug, dug tunnels. And we'd dig in those tunnels, the water level was seven feet below the surface. And we'd dig down next to the fireplace in each room that had an old flat billet stove. And we'd, we'd dig this, dig all day long, and then we'd put the dirt in our pockets and then sprinkle it around when we were standing out there to be counted by the guards. And uh, it would take months to, to dig a tunnel that go out 127 or 150 feet away from where you started the tunnel uh, to where it ended outside of the fence. And uh, Russ was in, in that capacity of solitary for all that time. And those of us who were always attempting to escape would sometimes sit be in the room next to him, uh, the cell, and uh, when he would hear the guards, Russ would hear the guards go away from where they turned around right in front of his, his cell. And I was in that cell next to him on a number of occasions, and he would wait to knock on the wall and ask if you can hear me. And he never met me. He was a colonel and I was just a flight officer. So he wouldn't even have, a, have had any reason to know me, but everyone knew who he was. And he would encourage me. He said, I'm proud of you. He said, 
you're, you're what I wanted all of my prisoners to be like. Make it so difficult they can't stand having you in here. And uh, you let them know for sure that, that you've never given up and never will. And each time I would see him, I'd get another friendly lecture like that. And he, he would tell me, he would, he would try to do everything he could to encourage me. Keep at him, keep at him. And uh, he, he lived to, right through the war. And uh, I, I made my escape, and it was just a, I was the first to go. And we had not had anybody successfully escape until my, my departure. And then there was an influx of it. The war was within two weeks of folding up. We could hear the Russian cannons coming our way and knew we were going to be overtaken by the Russians. I, that's the, the time at which I got out. And uh, I got out with two other uh, uh, prisoners and we were on the open countryside. After a few days, we got so hungry, I said, we're going to have to go into this farmhouse and see if we can get something to eat. And uh, we're just going to have to take our chances. And so we did. And uh, there was a lady there, and she spoke a little bit of English, or understood it even more. And she cooked us some eggs, which we hadn't had since Lord knows when, and, and uh, fed us. And, and I wrote a note and said, to whom it may concern, this lady has assisted us in our escape. Please give her every consideration when our forces come through here. And she didn't read the note. And so I shook hands with her and we, the three of us walked away. And we had to, to get there, we had to swim across a, a part of the Baltic Sea there in the wintertime in December. And, uh, I'm telling you that icy water was something else. There were two of us in the water, one sitting on some logs we got out of the woods and tied them together with grapevines. And the one who couldn't swim held our clothes and our shoes. And we got in that freezing water and, and got across this span of um, the, that, that water there. We were on a peninsula on the North Sea and I, anyway, the end of it was that the lady, I heard her screaming after we had left. And I had thanked her and shaken hands with her. And then I, I was, we were walking away and I, I heard her screaming and she was running toward us. And I turned and ran back to see what was wrong. And she handed me a gun and a piece of paper that she had in her hand was my note saying, please give this lady every consideration for helping us. And she gave me the gun and some, some cartridges and said, this will do you more good than it will me. And uh, I wish you luck. And that's the last we ever saw of the lady. But the gun helped us. Later we got two bicycles and the third party that escaped with us wanted to be on his own, and uh, he got a bicycle, and I never heard from him again. And uh, uh, Jerry Ennis was from my fighter group, and he never wanted to fly again. And we found an airfield that was empty with, with airplanes that were shot up all over it, and saw, they were all in revetments. And I went from one revetment after another. They were deserting us so massively. And nobody paid any attention. So it wasn't a big deal. And uh, I, I went and I found this one airplane that was full of fuel. It had lots of bullet holes in it, but nothing was vital. None around the engine. And it, had, it was full of fuel, so I knew that they had thought it was going to be flying again. And so I, I, I told Jerry, I said, I thought I knew how to start the engine because Gus Lundquist was another prisoner who had tested the airplane for 10 hours before 
he talked the general into letting him make one combat mission in a Mustang. And he made that mission, got shot down, and nobody knew that he had been testing the German captured airplanes in England before he was captured. And they didn't know it. He, he finally confided, confided into me uh, that that's what was it, what had happened to him. And I told him that that was my assignment, hopefully going to be my assignment after the war. And he said, uh, he, he told me all about everything that I needed to know about the 190 and, and some of the other airplanes. And without his knowledge, I thought I could never get the airplane started. Well, several months went by before the war ended, and I went, got on this airfield and I found this airplane full of gas, but it didn't have a parachute. It, it didn't, I couldn't sit down in the, in the seat and still see out. I could just barely get my eyes at the level of the sides of the cockpit. And I decided I'm, I'm going, I, get, I had the gun, I gave it to Jerry and said, we'll bring the next uh, maintenance guy that comes by here. I'm going to motion him in here and, and I said, we'll get him to start the engine because I looked at his cockpit and I, could, I couldn't figure out how to start it. And I'd forgotten everything Rick Gussie told me about. It. So we, this happened in the man. I had him come in and, and we put the gun on and I had the gun to Jerry and I said, I'm going to get in the cockpit. I couldn't find anything to fill up the cavity where the parachute uh, is located, and you're sitting on it, and that gives you enough room to stand, to see over the side. But I was just barely able to see out because I had to sit down in the hole. And I got the canopy closed. He started the engine, and Jerry kept his gun, gun on him and, and took him away from the airplane. He said he said he's going to kill him if I didn't get airborne. I didn't even taxi to the runway, I just went straight out, straight up, and here I'm sitting in an airplane with swastikas, no parachute, and a second lieutenant would have been looking for some target like me. I went up to a ceiling, it was clouds, at about 4,000 feet, and I thought, well, you got to be the dumbest pilot that ever lived, because here you are in an enemy airplane, swastikas, and you have no parachute, and the war is almost over, and what the heck are you trying to gain? And I don't know what I was trying to gain, but it had been in my mind to escape so much, I just wanted so to get out, get my own freedom on my own way. And I got it airborne, and uh, Jerry, Jerry ta taught French, and so that's the way we communicated with the sergeant, the uh, German sergeant, uh, maintenance person. And that's how we got it. he got it started for me. It was the dumbest thing I've ever done. And I landed in Holland. Holland was on our side. And they saw me land in this field because I couldn't find an airport. And I wouldn't have landed there anyhow because all of the airfields were uh, set up with dynamite so that our forces, when we came across Africa, they'd get blown up when we'd go into a, a, a field that we captured from the Germans. And so I landed in this field, and I was going through some trees to get to a little dirt road I'd seen, hoping I could find some Dutchmen. But lo and behold, the Dutchmen thought I was a German. And all of a sudden, pitchforks came at me from all angles, and I kept pointing towards a, this little dirt road I'd seen when I was circling the land. And the field looked good, but when I got down on the ground, I could see there's a ditch coming up, and the weeds were covering it, and I couldn't see it from there. And so I had to ground up and wipe out the landing gear and skid to a stop. Otherwise, I would have been flipped upside down in the airplane trap. And they wouldn't have cared anyhow because I would have been the enemy. Well, they didn't 
They let me walk out, and I kept my hands up and kept pointing toward this dirt road. They followed me, and as good luck would have it, uh, a British truck came by, and I was waving my arms frantically, and the truck stopped, and I said, I'm an American pilot. I came out, I came out of a German airplane. They think I'm a kraut, and I said, I'm trying to get away and get back to our lines. And they said, I say, old chap, pop in. <laughs> so I put in the cab of the truck, and off we went. And the rest is history. But was it a, a big thing? No. Was it a dumb thing? The dumbest thing anybody could ever have done. <laughs> Tim, I've, I've been interviewing people for 40 years. If I have a memory like this at 94 almost, come to my story. I understand now why you needed the time. His detail, and you're going to see it in the film in a moment, is remarkable. Kim, for you, um, you have a star-studded lineup in this movie. You have, we have memories with Chuck Hager. You're going to see Neil Armstrong does the open. Th this is a real treat for our viewers tonight to get to see these people speaking about Bob Harrison Ford and the impression that Bob has made on all their lives. Yes. Well, I mean, it is, it, Bob has really touched the trajectory um, of our aviation industry over the last century. I mean, he's gone from flying fabric aircraft to, you know, modern jets to supersonic and, you know, participant in helping to break the speed of sound. So, um, you know, these, these other star studs, we say star studded. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, uh, his friends are incredibly accomplished as well. I mean, there's Clay Lacey, um, Eugene Siernan, uh, you know, you know, Harrison Ford, who's obviously a huge celebrity, incredibly accomplished pilot, uh, incredible ambassador for aviation, Sean D. Tucker, um, you know, the, the list goes on and on. So I was very privileged, um, the fact that, um, you know, Mr. Hoover has, you know, it's kind of a, a who's who of friends. And these are real friends and people who they share information and they care very much about, you know, aviation and aerospace and our aerospace future. So it's not, it wasn't just about, you know, well, here's what happened in the past, but you know, all of these people, they talk, they get together, they care, they care about not just what happened in the past, but what's going to happen in our aerospace future as well. And so, you know, it was important just to be a fly on the wall and to as unobtrusively as possible collect this you know, this legion of friends and their viewpoints and obviously tell Mr. Hoover's story. Uh, so it was a huge privilege. Viewers will also learn something about Harrison Ford and his own flight history that I didn't know until I saw this. In honor of Bob Hoover and his legacy as the pilot's pilot, the Citation Jet Pilot Association has established presidential scholarships at Embry-Riddle benefiting flight students at the Daytona Beach and Prescott campuses. Students who receive these scholarships get the rare and exciting opportunity to interact with members of the CJP Association at a variety of special engagement activities and events. For you, Bob Hoover, an excellent opportunity for an association as these people honor your service and your work in aviation. Your thoughts? Well, I've never been more privileged than when I had the opportunity uh, to do something uh, towards helping others uh, achieve what they wish to do. And Limber Riddle seemed like the right place to start. Uh, they historically have, have been the forerunner in aviation education to its fullest. And uh, they, uh, as a result, turned out a great many young people that have become executives in major corporations. Uh, it's far-reaching uh, that the accomplishments that that, that uh, School of Aviation has been able to provide for our young people. And I'm so privileged uh, when I go to those events where uh, they're receiving an award or, or a scholarship uh, 
that can't help but make you feel good. And uh, I was privileged to to be a contributor to that uh, support. Two final questions. Kim, all the hours you spent and the time assembling this, and then you've promoted this film, which came out, I believe, in 2014. Can you identify for our audience a single thing that you learned about Bob Hoover that stands out about him as a person and as an aviator? You know, it's funny because the thing that jumps to mind is actually a tie. And it has to do with um, professionalism. I mean, this is a top professional in his field who never took no for an answer, who never, um, who had a lot of setbacks and never, you know, never stopped heading for what he was trying to achieve. And a professional in every sense of the word in what he does and what he's done. And so professionalism and Part and parcel of that is a way that he, it's not just generational. He is a very special person as far as interpersonal relationships and how he treats people. Um, there is a reason why so many pilots uh, look to him and look up to him and revere him. And that's about professionalism, his flying, but also He's just been a good friend to aviators for a really long time. And he's a, a gentleman and he treats people in a way that he, um, you know, he can sleep well at night knowing that he's treated them in a certain way. And, um, you know, I, as much as I've studied about what he's done, um, I think just the privilege of working with him personally for four years has impacted me in ways that I'll be remembering for decades to come. Finally, for you, Bob Hoover, for you. they're going to hear a little about Chuck Hager in this movie as well. Tell us, how did you develop your relationship with Chuck Hager? Well, uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, I met Chuck and I didn't. I had never met him before, but I was in flight test at Wright Field. Chuck was a maintenance officer, and uh, that meant that he took care of airplanes if you had engine problems or anything like that. They'd take care of it in maintenance, and then he would fly them around the field and check them out and, and say they're okay. Uh, I was doing the experimental work where you are uh, doing research development. And uh, I was working on compressibility. And compressibility is a big word for airflow disturbances. And that's what the sound barrier was. And that's what we were worried about, why we couldn't go faster than sound, was a sound barrier. And it was because of this compressibility, which is an air, airflow breakdown between the wing and the fuselage the tail assembly, and the fuselage. And that was a big breakthrough. And I was on that project as the youngest test pilot uh, to ever do it. And uh, there were three of us on the program uh, trying to get, get through compressibility. And we used P-51s and P-47s as our test beds. And, uh, I was doing that time kind of work, and Chuck was the maintenance officer, as I indicated. And, and during the course of that time, uh, I was selected to be the pilot to fly the X-1 for its supersonic flight. And uh, the, the colonel that I reported to, uh, who had made my selection, uh, was transferred, and a new colonel moved in. And he had been a maintenance officer, and uh, he had never been through a test pilot school, nor had Chuck. And so uh, he, he said uh, he just heard that uh, one of our airplanes, one of the test airplanes, had buzzed an airport in Springfield, Ohio, which is about 20 miles away from right field where we were doing our test work. And uh, he said, uh, 
were you flying that airplane? And I said, yes, sir. The new colonel said that to me. And he said, well, I know two things about you, young man. He said, you're honest, but I don't think you're trustworthy because I don't think you should ever buzz that airfield. And I said, uh, well, sir, I, 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 didn't have, I didn't know anybody would even think twice about it. I just made a pass across the airfield upside down. And he said, well, I, I don't consider that uh, as being very wise and uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to ruin you from the number one position on the X-1. And I thought, oh boy, I was so disappointed. And uh, I thought about some of my uh, competitors for the slot. And I didn't feel that, that most of them had the courage to risk their life as I had been doing and had been accustomed to doing from combat uh, on so many missions. And I, I was really down in the dumps. And he called me in and said, uh, uh, do you know Captain Yeager? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, that's who I've, whom I've selected, because he was a, a maintenance officer. And I thought, well, gee, he's not even been to the test pilot school. He will not know what we're talking about. And uh, I had just a few days before been out flying a P-38, and it was a P-59 in the sky, and I went over and I bounced him just like fighter pilots like to do. And he tried to, to shoot me down with his jet, and he couldn't do it, nor could I hit him. And Chuck was at a double ace in War II, and he was so skilled, it was unbelievable. I did everything I could do to try and get rid of him, and uh, I could never get my gun sight on him long enough to say I could shoot him down, nor could he get his on me. And when I came in and landed and parked my P-38, he parked his the P-59 Bell jet next to my airplane, and he said, fella, uh, he said, I've never met anybody to fly an airplane like that. And I said, well, I've never met anybody to equal your capability. And that was the beginning of my friendship. So when Boyd called me in and said he had selected Chuck, I didn't let him know it, but I was smiling from ear to ear because I respected Chuck Yeager as the finest pilot I'd ever seen. And I can tell you for sure right this minute that no one in this world could have done a better or more efficient job of do, testing and developing the X-1 than Chuck. And uh, my hat's been off to him uh, ever since. And he did everything just right. And uh, incidentally, he once saved my life. And I was, uh, we were both doing work at way far out, more so than what astronauts later got. But Chuck and I were chosen as the first guinea pigs to see what man could really stand. And we were considered two normal people. And they put us in the centrifuge and would take us to unconsciousness. The centrifuge spins you up at very high velocities and g-forces. And they wanted to see how much we could, how we could take before we'd lose consciousness. And then they would put us in, in the pressure chamber and take us to 65,000 feet. And that's where we'd have to fly. And of course, as everyone knows, it's beyond the sensible atmosphere and there's not enough oxygen. You have to have pressure breathing. Well, uh, Chuck and I were, were working in that chamber at altitudes that would make us unconscious, uh, take us to unconsciousness. And one day I was, there were doctors always looking through the the little uh, window that opened up into the, the chamber, and 
Chuck was looking through the window, and it, the, the doctors, the link doctor, was coming on duty, and they were talking, and Chuck said, Bob's in trouble. And this is something that most people would never know, but I'll share it with you. When you are at 65,000 feet, and you want to say, I'm in trouble, or I've got a mayday, you can't, your voice is gone. You cannot, if you can't breathe, you can't talk. And so I was trying to let somebody know that I'm, I'm going to die in another few seconds if, if they don't catch me real quick. And I started waving my arms, and Chuck was looking through the people over there, and, and he said, Dr. Bob's in trouble. And he really saved my life because they got on me quick enough and I didn't lose consciousness. One day Chuck had, was on the X-1 and he was, he had a, a decompression and it happened at altitude, but when his suit pressured on him, he, he got blinded in the cockpit and I talked him all the way down to the ground and I, he did everything just right. And as soon as, as he got on the ground and was rolling out, he thanked me for saving his life. And I said, okay, pardon. Now we're even. Because he'd saved my life in the chamber. But Chuck deserves every accolade he'll ever get. And I'm proud to be able to say that. There you have it. You're about to see a movie that has been uh, a love of the life of uh, Kim First. For Kim First and Bob Hoover, thank you for sitting for this interview. And from all of us here, a round of applause to you for your service to aviation and to your nation. Kim, congratulations. Once again, thank you. We're going to begin the movie in a moment, but we do bid you an adieu and a very pleasant evening in California. Thank you for coming to us from your home today. Thank you, Mark. What an honor. Thank you. Bob, Godspeed. Good luck. Good health. Thank you.